Stephen. And I'm really excited to tell you all about this work because I've never told anybody about this work before. So this is the first time presenting it to the world. This is work with my PhD supervisor here at Caltech, Joel Tropp, developing some algorithms for randomized low rank approximation. Let me give you an overview of what I'm gonna tell you about today. I'll start with an introduction, which will motivate why this subject is important and why you should care about it. And then I wanna teach you about three different randomized algorithms, randomized SVD, randomized subspace iteration, and randomized block Krilov iteration. And I'm aware that folks might not be experts in randomized numerical linear algebra. So I'll try to buy, provide some very concrete examples showing you what these algorithms look like when you perform them on particular matrices. I'll provide theory for the different algorithms. And lastly, there's a little bit of icing on the cake where I'll talk about even further improvements, ways to make it even faster, ways to reduce the cost even more. So let's hop right in to the background section. Randomized SVD has been a very impactful method. It's used for the low rank approximation of really large matrices. So imagine a matrix that's 10,000 by 10,000 or bigger, and it could be as big as a million by a million, for example. This algorithm is going to work on such matrices pretty quickly. It's gonna require just a few lines of code and it's widely used nowadays across scientific computing. The algorithm is often really good. It's successful at approximating matrices with quickly decaying singular values. So if your singular values are really high, but then lower and lower and lower and lower and lower, and the decay rate is exponential and fast, you can expect this algorithm to do great. However, there are significant random errors when the singular values decay slowly. You can see this happen all the time in applications. Folks wanna use this approach in genetics. They wanna use it for inverse problems and they find they're just not getting a very good low rank approximation. Our motivation is we wanna make this better. We wanna develop a more accurate method for slowly decaying singular values. And we wanna provide people some efficient pseudocode that'll let them actually implement it on the ground. We also wanna provide error bounds that demonstrate mathematically that it's guaranteed to work. And the big results from this investigation, which I've been working on with Joel for about six or nine months now, is that randomized block Krilov iteration is the method of choice. It's currently the most accurate known method for low rank approximation, improving on all previous approaches. So this is the introduction, background and motivation. And now I'll tell you the story in detail, explaining how we get to this point. So the idea in randomized SVD, randomized singular value decomposition, is to approximate a really large matrix using a random low rank approximation. So I've written A hat, this is the approximation of A, is this random projection A omega acting on the big matrix A. And here omega is really random. It's an N by K random matrix, which typically is just gonna have independent standard Gaussian entries. K, the number of columns in this matrix omega, is what we call the width parameter. And that's typically between 10 or 1,000, although you can see it as big as 1,000 in applications. Sorry, it's, it's between 10 and 100, typically sometimes as big as 1,000. We want to be able to store A hat fast. We want to be able to manipulate it even faster. And so what the algorithm is gonna do is factorize it. It'll store it in a factorized form that you can access and use easily. 
which is a hat is u sigma v star, where u and v are going to be orthogonal matrices that are really tall and really skinny. And then sigma is going to be a diagonal matrix, which is short and squat. So you can see this factorization right here. Does this factorization make sense to folks? Yes. Yes. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So that's what the algorithm is going to give you. Here's the pseudocode. And it's really not too bad. It's really just a few lines of code. You start by generating a random matrix, omega. You calculate the QR factorization of A omega, which is going to give you a representation of the range space in the orthonormal columns of Q. Then, Calculate the SVD of A star Q, and that'll give you U hat V and sigma. Setting U to be Q U hat, you can return this factorized approximation, just like I said the algorithm provides. And I recognize that despite there being only four lines, this is actually a lot to take in all at once. So a quick proof of correctness maybe can help you to think about what's going on. By definition, we've got this approximation A hat, which is a random projection of A. And the way that you can represent a projection operator mathematically is with Q, Q star, where Q is representing the range space. Then what we've done is we've taken a singular value decomposition of A star Q, which is exactly the same as the singular value decomposition of Q star A. And lastly, just multiply Q and U hat, and we get out this factorized approximation. And the reason I'm walking you through this pseudocode in a lot of detail here is because I want to point out the most expensive steps. The two most expensive steps are going to be the multiplications with this giant matrix A. The first step that's going to be really expensive occurs in the second step of the algorithm. You're going to multiply A with an n by k matrix. And that's going to be tough. You know, you're multiplying a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix with a 10,000 by 10 or 10,000 by 100 matrix. And then again, you got to multiply A star with an M by K matrix. You're multiplying your giant A matrix by something tall and skinny yet again. So these are typically going to be the most expensive steps. This algorithm has been around for a while with roughly the same form. It was proposed in 2007 by Rocklin and Yale. And then it was discussed in a really influential Siam review paper by Halko Martinson and Joel Trott, my advisor, which now has over 3,000 citations. It's been really impactful because it's widely used, excuse me, it's widely used for finding the top singular vectors, which people want to do a lot when they're doing principal component analysis, for example. And then it's also used sometimes for eliminating the bottom singular vectors which would be used, for example, in the denoising of images. You wanna get rid of a lot of high frequency noise and just have clean images to work with. You can try removing the bottom singular vectors. The performance is pretty great on the surface. It's two to 10 times faster than traditional methods that would be implemented, for example, in MATLAB. And it's faster because large matrix matrix multiplications are very, very efficiently implemented on modern computers using BLAS3 operations that take advantage of any parallelization that you have access to on your computer. They really carefully divide up the matrix into pieces so that it can be quickly accessed in your cache. And then multi-threading is also used on many devices to speed up these matrix matrix multiplications further. So because of these 
very, very technical details involving have, large matrix matrix multiplications. They're fast. Yes. I have a question. I heard something like laws free operations and it didn't register at all. Oh, yes. This is really under the hood, but this is what happens with MATLAB when you just try to multiply two big matrices. What your computer is going to do is with highly optimized code, it's going to look at little pieces of the matrices at a time. It's going to divide it into blocks where the block size is completely optimized based on your computer's caching capabilities and any multi-threading capabilities and potentially even parallelization capabilities. And what was that name, Laws Free? Can you spell it out? So BLAS, BLAS3, yeah. Acronym so, for what? Oh gosh, what is BLAS an acronym for? Do people know? <laughs> so, you know, BLAS2 would be a matrix vector product and that would be comparatively slow and inefficient. BLAS3 would be a matrix matrix product and that would be highly optimized. Okay. So it's BLAS numeral three and I can look it up. You got it, you got it, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks for the question. Algebra I like questions. Excuse me? Uh, just that according to the internet is basic linear algebra subprogram. Oh, basic linear algebra subprogram. What a great acronym. Now, Continuing on, the speed is good, but the accuracy depends, right? When singular values decay quickly, it's going to accurately just recover the truncated SVD, which is exactly what you want for low rank approximation. However, when singular values decay slowly, significant random errors are going to occur. And so that's just a big problem with the method. I wanna give you an example to show you what these random errors look like, and also show you what the method looks like when it's performing well. So this is a really great, really simple example that I cooked up this week for this presentation. We're gonna consider a matrix A and a perturbed matrix B. And the matrix A is just as simple as you could wish. It's a diagonal square matrix whose diagonal entries are one e to the negative 10th, e to the negative two tenths, e to the negative three tenths, all the way down to e to the negative 999 and nine tenths. So it's a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, but it's a diagonal matrix. And then B is just gonna be a very tiny perturbation of A with entry-wise random noise that's Gaussian independent noise in all the entries with standard deviation two thousandths. Now, we'll find that the top sigma i values are really similar between matrices A and B. However, the bottom singular values look totally different. Here's a plot. I calculated all the singular values, which was a really, really expensive computation, but I did it for pedagogical purposes. And you can see indeed, maybe the top 10 sigma i values are agreeing really closely. But then the singular values of A are just continuing their beautiful exponential decay, whereas the singular values of B seem to get stuck for a very long time at a size that's about two tenths or three tenths. And this has a lot to do with spiked covariance models. If people have studied those before, it's a big question with spiked covariance models. How much noise can you add and still be able to discern the underlying signal? I've not added too, too much because the signal's still there, but I've added enough that there's slowly decaying singular values. Now, here's what it looks like. It's a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, but I'm just representing the first four rows and columns. And A looks beautiful. It's just got diagonal entries. All the off diagonals are zero. And then B is tiny perturbations of about size two thousandths. So you can see we're increasing and increasing, decreasing and decreasing, just but by a very small amount. Yes. Uh, so like, just understand, so the perturb, 
so if you take the expectation of the perturbed matrix, right, then, mm -hmm. um, oh, wait, okay, so the noise is just, ah, oh, okay, so you add, okay, so this is not the covariance, B is not a covariance matrix, it's not a sample covariance matrix, it's a matrix with, with entries for which you, you have this magnitude. Okay, yep. I see. Okay. Yeah. Nice. This is a cheap, wonderful well, we can way. Just that that B has like uh, all the eigenvalues at least like sigma square. It's not the case because it's something slightly different because that's not what you do. You add up entry wise. Your perturbation is entry wise. Okay. Yeah, it's entry wise. It's entry wise. And I'm cooking up this example to show you the success and failure of randomized SVD. You can see when you take a small width, like k equals 10, that you're doing a meh job at representing A using the randomized SVD. And you're doing an absolutely terrible job with k equals 10 at representing this perturbed matrix B. However, we can raise k from that level 10 to the level 100 and now we're doing a whole lot better. We're basically representing the top four rows and columns of A perfectly faithfully up to the amount of accuracy that I'm showing. And then B still looks really bad. B still looks so far off in the diagonal entries from what they're really supposed to be. So what's going on here? Two things are going on. Firstly, Raising K is clearly improving the accuracy. Secondly, the slowly decaying singular values are causing significant random errors for the algorithm. And so let's look at some theory that explains why this is happening. The first proposition I'm showing you is simple, but really essential. Bigger projection, better approximation. If you've got any matrix A and two orthogonal projectors, P1 and P2, so that the range of the first one is contained in size the range of the second one, then you're going to do a much better job with P2. You're going to have much less error when you approximate through projecting using P2. And this is true in the spectral norm. This is true in the Frobenius norm. This is true in any unitarily invariant norm. This justifies why increasing K is always going to improve the approximation. We're always using more random columns to do the approximation. We're always going to do a better job in randomized SVT. For the rest of the talk, we're going to just use this proposition again and again, hopefully in creative and interesting ways. We'll try to enlarge the approximation space, and we'll try to do it cost efficiently. This is the single most important proposition for all that follows. It's simple and it's qualitative, but it's really enough to go on as you develop smarter and smarter algorithms. Joel and I did develop some more quantitative error bounds. And there's a lot of moving pieces here, but I've tried to highlight the bits that are most important. Randomized SVD with width K is going to produce a low rank approximation that satisfies an expectation bound up top, valid for any R value less than or equal to K minus two. And then if you folks prefer to think about concentration inequalities instead of expectation bounds, I've also provided a concentration inequality. They look pretty similar to one another. And the key point is that these bounds are going to be really great if the singular values are small and quickly decaying in the tail. If we can sum up all of these singular values from R plus one on down to the bottom, and we get out something that's not too big, then these bounds are going to guarantee that the size of the error is on the same scale as sigma R plus one which means we're close to the optimal rank R approximation. However, these bounds blow up with dimension 
if the sigma i values in the tail decay slowly? What happens if this isn't summable? Well, the error is just going to get worse and worse with dimension. The extent to which this is quickly summable determines the success of the algorithm, both theoretically and empirically. Just a quick question. Do you have a lower bound for this? Do I have a lower bound? Yes. Is it? We know what the worst case is. The worst case is when you just have two blocks of singular values. You oh. have an alpha block that's up high and a beta block that's down low. Yep. And you try to approximate that matrix. And I think Candes has some implicit lower bounds. Well, but I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I kind of calculate this on top of my head. So it's a question to you. <laughs> but it's yeah, like... yeah, yeah. I haven't looked too much at the um, lower bounds. Although, to be honest, that would kind of help my argument because I'm going to try to argue that randomized SVD is not so great and that other algorithms improve on it. So it would be a good exercise. So thank you for that. I've not done it yet, but you know I, I know what the worst case is for this algorithm. So you know yeah. it would just be an explicit calculation, which would be, mm -hmm. you know, some work but doable. Now, folks realized that RSVD wasn't that great. The developers of RSVD realized that it has problems back in 2010 when you've got slowly decaying singular values. And they proposed this fix called randomized singular, randomized subspace iteration, randomized subspace iteration. Here's the algorithm. It's pretty similar to before. You're approximating a large matrix using a random low rank projection, but the projection's a little different. Now you're projecting onto the range of A, A star raised to the Q power, A omega. So, Omega is going to be a tall, skinny matrix with independent Gaussian entries. K is a width parameter. These two things are exactly the same as before. What's new is the depth parameter, Q, which in practice would typically be between one and five. As you raise Q, this systematically improves the approximation. So this is the new lever that Rockland and co-authors added which will help solve the problems for slowly decaying singular values. Note for Q equals zero, this algorithm is just gonna reduce to randomized SVD, but for higher Q values, we'll hope for better performance. The pseudocode is just really similar to randomized SVD with the exception that now we're doing a loop. For I equals zero all the way to Q, we're looping over a QR factorization and another matrix multiplication. And as a result of this loop, our most expensive steps are gonna get multiplied. So before we had just two multiplications with A, and now we're gonna have two times Q plus one multiplications, half with A and half with A star. So this is more expensive, but maybe we need it to do a good job. In fact, I'm gonna show you by returning to this original example that randomized subspace iteration does succeed if you raise Q high enough. If you raise Q just to zero, you've got the same poor quality as before because the algorithm is exactly the same as randomized SVD. But as we raise Q higher, we start to see better performance. We can raise Q higher again. And A hat is almost exactly the same as A. B hat still looks kind of different from B. This is depth Q equals two already. Depth Q equals three, A hat has fully converged. And B hat is well on its way. And then I'll raise it two more times. Q is four. We're getting a slightly better approximation in the four, four entry. And lastly, Q equals five, the algorithm has basically converged. It's never quite going to reach B, but it is going to reach the optimal rank 10 approximation to B. And that 
looks like this current B hat iterate. We have theory, which explains that raising Q generally has to work. And so again, I've highlighted the most important bits and I've provided an expectation bound and a matching concentration inequality. What these bounds indicate is now we're looking at the log error and we're seeing in the highlighted squares that the log error is decreasing at a rate Q to the negative one as Q goes to infinity. So this means that regardless of how high these sums involving the tail singular values might be, we are going to be able to raise Q large enough that the algorithm converges. So this is good. It's better than our SVD, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. And that's gonna be the second half of the talk, the room for improvement. I'm gonna stop dwelling so much in the past and start telling you all about the algorithms that you should be using. Just a very quick, mm -hmm. uh, just a very quick, uh, and uh, I'm sorry for my rude interruptions. So just no, this is great. Uh, I love back and forth. So like Q is uh, intuitively is the size. So roughly Q is that if I have a blockwise model with uh, blocks of size Q instead of one, such that uh, within the the block I'm roughly equal. I'm roughly like even, and like overall the blocks still geometrically fast decrease decrease geometrically fast, then this is the cue that I should take here, roughly. Is that the right intuition or not? Like where, but my question is where, like how should I, uh, you know, in a, in a toy example, in this toy example that I described, let's say how, like what, sh what cue should I take? Um, that's first question. Second question is, uh, are there like adaptive variants of this algorithm that try to understand uh, what is the right size of the block while they proceed? Yeah. So the answer to your second question is easier for me because it's yes. Nice. It is yes. Uh, MATLAB for a long time until about 2021 didn't implement randomized SVD or randomized subspace iteration. Although there are some users who can kind of contribute their own little MATLAB code. The official developers didn't implement it. Mm -hmm. And then they came out with an adaptive variety in 2021. And the adaptive variety is, is really simple because it is calculating a Frobenius norm at the beginning by a pass over the whole matrix. And then it's fixing a depth Q. So that has to be a user parameter, unfortunately it's increasing K. It's increasing K adaptively until the Frobenius norm has fallen to say one one hundredth of its original value. And the reason it's Frobenius norm, although it's quite stupid, is because uh, we would prefer operator norm kind of, but it's yeah. probably long to compute, but Frobenius norm can be computed in the entries. So that's why. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So that one as of 2021 was finally implemented in MATLAB, but do note that that's, fixing Q and raising K. So there's not yet a great implementation out there that fixes K and raises Q, which is more what you were asking with your first question. I mean, how big do we raise Q? Yeah, roughly how big K do we raise Q? Block probably, right? The number of blocks. Well, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Are you, I assume you're a mathematician, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So, so I'm a mathematician too. And, um, you know, I'll tell you what people do though, who are scientists. Um, they pick it as big as they can afford it and usually not bigger than five. So, okay, I see. you know, that's what you see in all of the publications. Um, one to five is the typical range. And this is often applied to big, big matrices and folks just run out of computational resources. So it would be nice to have an adaptive implementation though. It's a really good idea. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you guys about block Krylov iteration. That's what I'm really stoked about. 
So I would say randomized subspace iteration is fundamentally wrong. It's fundamentally wrong and the right algorithm is randomized block Krylov iteration. And that's because RBKI is gonna use a bigger random projection. This time it's gonna project onto this Krylov subspace of depth Q. And this is the biggest subspace that you can use. It uses all of the different columns that you formed sequentially in your matrix matrix multiplications. It stacks them all into a big block matrix and that's what's gonna be used for the projection. Q again is a depth parameter between one and five, which systematically improves the approximation. For Q equals zero, again, the algorithm reduces to RSVD. But if you remember back to that first simple proposition, bigger approximation space, better approximation. Here, the approximation space is Q plus one times bigger in the sense that it has Q plus one times as many random columns in it. And so the RBKI is always going to yield a more accurate approximation. Yet, these are almost for free, these extra columns, because no additional matrix matrix multiplications are required. And this last point was actually hard for me and Joel to see at first, because previous RBKI implementations that appear in the literature for five or 10 years have been inefficient. I mean, they've started off okay. As you expect, you get Q plus one times a multiplication of A with an N by K matrix. Q times, you get a multiplication of A star with an M by K matrix. So that's like even better than randomized subspace iteration, which is Q plus one. But then one time, these previous implementations did something terrible. They multiplied A star with a M by K Q plus one matrix. So this is a really big block matrix. This C step can take up as much as 50% of the computation. And you can see the code, you're generating a random matrix, you're calculating some QR factorizations, and then you're doing it. You're doing the bad thing that you shouldn't be doing. You're calculating an SVD of A star Q1, Q2, all the way to Q, Q plus one. And so you've got to compute this matrix and then perform the SVD on it. And that's eating up so much of your compute time. But if you look kind of closely at the pseudocode, you can start to see that it's redundant because A star has already been multiplied by all of these Q basis elements. It's been multiplied right here, right in the step above. So one can fix up the code a little bit and just keep track of all these intermediate quantities and then perform the SVD directly on the block matrix formed by the intermediate quantities. And this makes all the difference in the world. Our, our randomized block Krylov implementation is much, much faster because it does what it's supposed to do. Q plus one times you multiply A with an N by K matrix. Q plus one times you multiply A star with an M by K matrix. It is the same cost in terms of matrix multiplications as randomized subspace iteration. And the cost savings can be up to 50%. They're up to 50% when the multiplications with A star are really, really expensive, which happens a lot of times when A star is a linear operator in a PDE model. And it means you've got to solve the adjoint operator, which involves integrating back in time, for example. So we've got this nice implementation and we can apply it to our original matrices. And we'll see that the performance is quite good. We start with a depth Q equals zero, and the algorithm reduces to randomized SVD. Raising Q, we quickly attain a near optimal approximation of the easy matrix A. And then 
it stabilizes already at Q equals two. We're starting to get a good approximation of B at Q equals two. And then it pretty much is converged at Q equals three. Whereas before randomized subspace iteration took five, Q equals five to really settle down. Now randomized block prelab iteration is only taking Q equals three to settle down. So it leads to faster empirical convergence than randomized subspace iteration. There's theory that explains what's going on. Again, we can look at the log error and we can produce an expectation bound and a matching concentration bound. The prefactors now are quite a bit better than before. Now we're seeing in the highlighted squares, one over 16 Q squared. The log error is now decreasing at a rate that's O Q to the negative two as Q is going to infinity. Whereas before, in randomized subspace iteration, we had a convergence rate that was only order Q to the negative one. So these algorithms are in totally different ballparks in terms of the convergence rate. Maybe it would take you a hundred iterations of randomized subspace iteration to achieve an approximation quality that you could achieve in just 10 iterations of randomized block Krelov iteration. So this method is, is much better. There's icing on the cake. And this is kind of the last bit of algorithmic improvements, which I don't think are available anywhere in the literature in quite this way that I'm gonna present to you right now. For symmetric matrices, there's a trick. For symmetric matrices, we can project onto an even bigger Krelov subspace. What happened? Oh, uh-oh. Oh no. Sorry about that, guys. Let me uh, get it loaded up again. The subspace was so big that uh, <laughs> just... Yeah, such a big subspace. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, icing on the cake. Boom. All right, thank you. That was just a weird technical glitch. A warning In... to Rob. Yeah. Before you post to YouTube, review the part where it pauses on your screenshot, but it's showing the rest of your computer. <laughs> it might, it might have information you don't want to share. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> I didn't mean I to will, be funny. I will review. I will review. Uh, thank you for your humor. Uh, and, and I'm optimistic that my computer is so boring. No, that, that was not I won't funny. Get in any trouble. I was not being funny. I get it. That's okay. A question. Yes. How specific? How specific you are? Are you sure? <laughs> anyway, sorry. No problem. Cool. So, guys, uh, instead of this Krelov subspace that we were using before, the a omega a a star a omega, all the way to a a star q a omega, we can use an enlarged Krelov subspace. So before we had to use one, three, five, seven matrix multiplications to produce output. And that's generally gonna be the best strategy when you have a non-symmetric matrix. When you have a symmetric matrix though, you might as well use one, two, three, four, all the way to two Q minus one matrix multiplications to build up a bigger and bigger subspace. The approximation space is two times bigger. So the approximation has to be more accurate. There are large benefits, quantifiable, provable benefits for PSD matrices. It's a reduction from Q iterations that were needed before to achieve a fixed accuracy to now just Q over square root of two iterations. And lastly, no additional matrix matrix multiplications are required. So this is another freebie. If we look before, we can see that the theory for general matrices had a one over 16 Q squared prefactor. And maybe we thought that was good enough, but now 
as we move to PSD matrices from general matrices to PSD matrices, that prefactor is improved to one over 32 Q squared. So the change from one over 16 Q squared to one over 32 Q squared is why we can run the algorithm for less iterations, yet achieve the same quality of approximation. Unfortunately, however, this one is not generally applicable. It does require symmetric matrices for you to apply the algorithm in this way. And it requires PSD or maybe negative semi-definite matrices for the theory to guarantee that it's quite this good. So as I move to examples, I can no longer include the matrix B. The matrix B was non-symmetric. It had a symmetric base, but the entry-wise independent Gaussian perturbations were not symmetric. So this particular approach wouldn't be applicable. However, we can apply it to A and we can see it converges in just one iteration to a perfect reconstruction of the first four rows and columns. Before it took us two, before with randomized subspace iteration, it took us three. Now we're down to a depth of Q equals one. RBKI for symmetric matrices is blazing fast. And there's one last trick. The one last trick is a recognition that we usually approximate A using an A hat left matrix, which has a projection operator on the left-hand side. A hat is PXA for some approximation space X. Why not use something a little different though? Is there any real reason why we shouldn't be using a right approximation, A PX, or a center approximation? A to the one half P, A to the one half X, a to the one half. These turn out to be really good options, both of them. The first one is called Bjarkeson approximation. The approximation where you've got a projection operator on the right hand side was suggested by Bjarkeson. And you can apply it to general matrices, just like you can use the left hand approximation, you can use the right hand approximation. But what's really cool about it is that it doesn't require an even number of matrix multiplications. Rather, it requires an odd number of multiplications. And you can use this to your advantage. It is great to use Bjarkeson approximation when multiplying with A is cheaper than with A star. Like when A is only implicitly coded, when you can only get matvex and it requires solving evolution equations forward in time. Well, A star would require solving the evolution equations back in time and would be often more expensive. So this can save you a lot of computational effort just to get rid of one of these A star multiplications. And the approximation is nearly as good. Nystrom approximation is this central approximation. And it, dates back to 1930. It's only applicable to PSD matrices, unfortunately. And you can see that. I mean, I'm taking A to the one half, and that really only makes sense if you are working with PSD matrices. You can compute it more easily than would meet the eye. This Nystrom approximation can be rewritten as AX and then the pseudo inverse of X star AX multiplied by X star A. But I like to introduce it as a central approximation because that reveals that it's gonna improve the accuracy by about a half a matrix multiplication. And that's what we see with the theory before, for PSD matrices, we were content with our 1 over 32 Q squared. We thought that was the absolute best we could do. But if we throw in the Nystrom approximation, 
Q gets replaced by Q plus a half. So you're doing even a little bit better. And at this point, I've introduced a ton of different methods. So maybe it'll help just to compare them. I've introduced randomized block Cree law iteration, which gives you a reduction from order Q to order square root of Q multiplications. I've introduced a variation, which works for general symmetric matrices and is provably great for PSD matrices, which gives you a further reduction from square root of Q to square root of Q over two multiplications. And then I've introduced some subtle twists due to Bjarkeson for general matrices and Nystrom for PSD matrices, which can maybe reduce the cost by one further multiplication, although it's not always guaranteed. They won't make it any worse, but they might not help that much. And I'm comparing the various methods by plotting the size of the random error against the number of matrix matrix multiplications. And what you're seeing is the random error is falling really slowly for this example, painfully slowly using randomized subspace iteration. It falls much more quickly using randomized block Krelov iteration, even for a non-PSD matrix. But then if it's a PSD matrix, this case is blazing fast. Randomized block Krelov iteration is even outperforming the general version for general matrices. The analysis is a lot. The analysis to actually prove the error bounds. But I knew this was a mathematical audience, so I'm gonna give you like a one slide sketch of the proof. Some of the proofs, some of the ideas of the proofs anyways. And then I'll conclude on the next slide. So, the first thing you got to do when you look at these algorithms is take a big detour, a deep dive into numerical linear algebra. And the particular approach that I exploited to get these nice error bounds was I used parallel sums of PSD matrices, which is a great idea due to Anderson and Dufin, where you're taking two matrices and you're figuring out how to do a harmonic mean, and then one half of the harmonic mean is the parallel sum between the two PSD matrices. This turns out to be an amazing type of operation. It's concave, it's monotonic, and you can really exploit it to get some nice error bounds. There was a really painful part of the analysis, just really grindy, like I had to work so hard, where you do a convexity analysis of these very particular Chebyshev polynomials. And the reason it's so grindy and terrible is because Chebyshev polynomials are not convex. So you're doing a convexity analysis of something that's not convex. And the way you do it is you say, okay, all you actually need is supporting lines. And at certain points, you can take supporting lines and use the same sort of Jensen's inequalities that you might generally apply to convex functions. And then the last bit is actually maybe of some broader interest. I was able to prove some new concentration inequality for inverse Wishart matrices. And this is what it looks like. It's sort of short and sweet. And it kind of explains the exact formula that I had for my concentration bounds. You've got a random matrix with independent Gaussian entries and it's R by R plus P. So it's not necessarily square, it's like rectangular. And then what we want to figure out is we want to figure out what's the Frobenius norm of the pseudo inverse, which is the same as bounding the sum of the eigenvalues of uh, inverse Wishart matrix. And you get these concentration inequalities that maybe aren't so great, but they really are the best you could ever hope for. You see, you have power law decay where the particular rate of the power law decay depends on the P, the amount to which this matrix is rectangular and not square. So that's some of the technical details just sketched really briefly. The conclusion 
is we've reduced the standard runtime of RBKI by 50%. We've provided explicit error bounds that reveal RBKI's efficiency. And we've slashed the number of matrix matrix multiplications that are needed for this algorithm, making low rank approximation cheaper and more accurate than ever before. And so with that, I'm at 51 minutes. Thank you so much for your attention. And if anyone has questions, I'd love to chat.